This is Saving the Game, a Christian podcast about tabletop role-playing and collaborative storytelling. Recorded Thursday, February 21st of 2019, it's episode 147. In this episode, Angels and Angelology, plus our favorite movies to talk about, more love for our podcasting friends, Bertrand gets a side quest, many strange angels, and more. Welcome to Saving the Game. I'm Grant. I'm Peter. And I'm Jenny. And I am in a rush because we have a lot to talk about tonight. My goodness, this is one of the longest (laughs) outlines we have made in a long time. Yep. Yeah, we actually deliberately decided to split this into two episodes when we finished with the outline before we even sat down to record. So Hey, look at us being proactive. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) All right. We are talking about angels tonight and next episode. Tonight, well... Maybe this morning, depending on exactly when you hear this episode. But, you know, for us, it's tonight. And we are going to be talking mostly about how angels are depicted, mostly in Scripture, sometimes in some other sources, uh, how they're categorized, their natures, all this sort of thing. Uh, This is a question that our Patreon supporters voted on. So I'm excited for that. And you guys get a double length episode because next session we're going to be to or next session as if it's a gaming session. Um, <laughs> recording session. Next recording session. Next gaming session. Next next uh, next episode. We're going to be talking about how to use angels in your games. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to have a whole episode just devoted to that. So that'll be great. First, I want to mention real quick that City on a Hill Gaming Its first two episodes are up, and we have recorded our second session. We just did that yesterday. It was great. Trather continues to roll nothing but sevens. (laughs) (laughs) Just uncanny consistency. I feel like we should start off each recording for City on a Hill with, like, that thing where you recalibrate the random number generator by just rolling 100 d20s. I I rolled two nat ones in a row. And I barely rolled well all session. It was it was not great. The only two rolls I made were a pretty good animal handling roll to befriend a squirrel. And I got to scare off a guy. That was great. The wizard was on fire, though. Oh, my goodness. That that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those guys were just those those dice were burning, man. (laughs) I do love that we managed to resolve an entire combat encounter in two rolls. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Now we're getting into spoiler territory. Look forward to these episodes. I'll make sure to link City on a Hill Gaming in the show notes. Uh, If you're not following them on your podcatcher of choice, you really should. And follow them on Twitter. They're great. Hang out with with Ryan in our Discord. He's great. Just all around awesome guy. If you haven't listened to the MinMax episode that Ryan was on, you definitely need to do that Mm -hmm. as well. I'll make sure to link that in the show notes as well. Yeah, that was 83, I want to say. That was great. Also in gaming news, we've once again barely managed to get any Eberron in. We had a lot of technical issues and that sort of thing, but we got a little bit further along. Not a whole lot to talk about there, really. But the vampire game that I'm preparing for is shaping up interestingly. I'm excited about that. I don't have a ton of detail to share about the game yet, but we've kind of worked out where the characters are going to be and what kind of the, the general themes are. And that was really good. We had a good session zero. Good. Almost session minus one, you might say, because <laughs> we're going to do session zero character creation this Sunday. This was a pre-character creation planning session. Like, what are what's this story about? That sort of thing. We're doing it set in London. And all of these characters are exploited people in people who were exploited in some way, often as part of the British Empire. Hmm. who are have been embraced and so one of the big themes is now hey i've got power am i going to turn into the same sort of monster that oppressed me hmm. i'm very excited it, we're gonna have a lot of fun with this it's gonna be cool yeah look forward to hearing about it i also think it's cool that you've managed to put together a group of mostly newer players just because that's that's good for their confidence and stuff and that's that's cool yeah yeah interestingly the one that i would say gave me the most trouble in character creation was probably the most experienced vampire player because she wanted to play something pretty out there Hmm. and then when she was like i've got two ideas like the first one was like ah i don't know i'm uncomfortable with this like not just like this would be hard but like it's uncomfortable Mm. and then she threw out the second one was like oh no that's great never mind this is good (laughs) yeah we do not have time to talk about vampire we have a patreon question we have a 
just a, a page, two pages of scripture to read. And then we've got much topic. I'm going to go ahead and roll a die. Okay, perfect. This is from Kenning. What is your favorite movie to talk about? Not necessarily a good movie, but an interesting one to talk about. Hmm. This is a really good question. I love this question. Thank you, Kenning. Probably the first Matrix. Huh. Like, you've you've got all kinds of neat sci-fi tropes. You've got some, like, philosophy and religion stuff in there. You can talk about all of the, like, the revolutionary camera techniques and stuff that they used for filming that. There's a lot to talk about in the first Matrix, and most of it's fun. I think I'm going to have to sort of, like, be a, a bit of a, a wimp about this and just the one that I've had the most productive conversations about recently has been The Shape of Water because it has it is it is it does so happen to be my favorite movie. It is one of the movies where I will never not be up for watching it, but it's also one of the movies that almost all of the people who have come into my library lately have wanted to talk with me about and we've talked at length about The Shape of Water and and all of us have greatly enjoyed it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely need to watch it. I like yeah, it's me too. on my to watch list. It's just Oh, it's so good. I I don't watch movies as a rule. And that's <laughs> that's one thing I should say. I don't watch a great many movies. I don't enjoy it as a process by and large, so I this is kind of a hard question for me. If I had to name one though, I would say Tim Burton's Big Fish. Yeah. Which I think is criminally underrated. Yeah. Also, it has uh, some personal significance to uh, my wife and I. It's kind of the, the movie we first watched together when we just started dating. Oh, that's sweet. Uh, it was one of those where, like, we were sitting there watching it. Oh, it's cute. And by the end, it was like, did you, were we paying any attention at all to the movie? No, we were fully engrossed each other. Okay. It took us a while to actually watch the whole movie all the way through. But I love the movie. It's beautiful. It's Tim Burton, I think, at his best, where he's being creepy and weird. But because he's telling Americana, it's a modern take on tall tales and folk tales in Americana, and I love it. Yeah. Tim Burton movies, each and every Tim Burton movie I've ever watched has given me a massive migraine. I don't know what it is. I have no idea. I have watched probably the whole of Big Fish in like 10 minute chunks. I've never watched it all in order. I, I know it's good, and I can accept that it's a, a, a really good movie, but... Tim Burton movies just give me, I I have to go lie down in a dark room for 12 hours. <laughs> it's entirely possible. I, I'm not a movie person, but it's entirely possible there's something about the cinematography that just does that. That's not unlikely. Eh, it's just his direction. I'm kidding, of course. It probably is, but <laughs> the, the cinematography, I mean. But anyway, that's mine. Thank you, Kenny. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get our scripture done. We have quite a lot of this. By the way, if you want to support us on Patreon and get your own questions read, just go to patreon.com slash saving the game. All right, we've got a chunk from the Old Testament here. And because we have so much of this, we're breaking it up a little bit differently. So you're going to hear some of us read multiple sections in a row. It's fine. This first section is Genesis 3, 23 and 24. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the Tree of Life. We have 2 Kings 6.17. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And we have Isaiah 6, 1 through 4. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty." The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 4 to 21. I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. 
Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a human being, and on the right side each had the face of a lion, and on the left the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. They each had two wings spreading out upward, each wing touching that of the creature on either side, and each had two other wings covering its body. Each one went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, without turning as they went. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire or like torches. Fire moved back and forth among the creatures. It was bright, and lightning flashed out of it. The creatures sped back and forth like flashes of lightning. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. The rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved, and when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 through 14. When I looked up, I saw a man dressed in linen, and he had a belt made of gold from upaz around his waist. His body was like barrel, his face looked like lightning, his eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and legs looked like polished bronze. When he spoke, his voice sounded like the roar of a crowd. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me didn't see the vision. Yet they started to tremble violently, and they quickly hid themselves. So I was left alone to see this grand vision. I had no strength left in me. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. I heard the man speak, and as I listened to his words, I fainted face down on the ground. Then a hand touched me and made my hands and knees shake. The man said to me, Daniel, you are highly respected. Pay attention to my words. Stand up, because I've been sent to you. When he said this to me, I stood up, trembling. He told me, Don't be afraid, Daniel. God has heard everything that you said ever since the first day you decided to humble yourself in front of your God so that you could learn to understand things. I have come in response to your prayer. The commander of the Persian kingdom opposed me for twenty-one days, but then Michael, one of the chief commanders, came to help me because I was left alone with the kings of Persia. I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the last days, because the vision is about times still to come. And we have Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And we have Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So our main topic tonight, as we said earlier, is angels. And in this particular episode, we're going to be going over scriptural and cultural is probably the best way of putting it, depictions and interpretations of exactly what they are. So to start out, we should probably define the term. An angel is, in most cases, a supernatural heavenly being who act as direct agents of God and declare or promote God's will. Unless you're like me. I, I have very weird beliefs about angels and, and stuff like that. Care to elaborate? I don't believe in supernatural stuff. I believe in natural stuff that's bigger than me. Yeah, eh, fair enough. It, it may sound pedantic, but I like to get pedantic about that kind of stuff. That's fair. But we are talking about 
how they're commonly portrayed, not just in scripture, but in Christian tradition, which extends outside, often well outside the, the bounds of scripture. And in scripture, they're almost exclusively seen in their role as messengers. I believe I saw somewhere that there's over 500 instances of angels being referred to or appearing in scripture. And in the vast majority of cases, they are messengers. These can also, we can also interpret angels sometimes as anybody who acts as a messenger from God. This is more of a theological question, but it is something perhaps worth mentioning as an aside. Angels are not always terrible in appearance, but as we saw in Daniel, for example, their presence seems to be completely overwhelming. In many cases, the first word an angel speaks are some variation of fear not. Yeah. Fear not, for unto you I bring tidings of good joy. Yeah, exactly. Now, we have a lot to talk about as far as angels go. Try as we might, we are not going to be able to cover everything in detail in this episode, even though we're going to do our best. But let's go ahead and get started. First off, interestingly, for all that you are probably thinking, oh, yeah, I, I know angels. I know a bunch of different angels. There's only two angels given names in the Bible and two others if you count fallen angels. Gabriel, who's a messenger seen in Daniel and the Gospels, and Michael, who is a warrior seen in Jude, Daniel, and Revelation. Uh, if you count the fallen angels, you have Satan and Apollyon, who's mentioned in Revelation. Not a big list. Not not a big list. No. All the other names you know, and we're going to talk about names in a little bit here, but all of those other names come from outside scripture. Now, it is interesting before we take off too much here. There are a whole bunch of unnamed angels mentioned in Scripture. We've read a bunch of the passages that they show up in. The creatures in Ezekiel are never given names, but they're described in pretty significant detail. The same is true for Isaiah and so on. We're also not talking about the Apocrypha, which is part of, of Scripture for a lot of denominations. I feel we should we should clarify that. We're using kind of the commonly accepted Protestant Bibles list of books here. Speaking of apocryphal works, a lot of what we do think of as traditions about angels come from those apocryphal works and deuterocanonical works. And there's a whole practice of studying and categorizing angels called angelology. Typically, angelology consists of dividing up angels into categories and hierarchies. And this is not limited to Christian hierarchies. There are Judaic, there's Judaic angelology, there's Islamic angelology, Zoroastrian, Kabbalistic, Merkaba, I just you name it, it's there. And they have their own hierarchies, their own names, that sort of thing. A lot of the apocryphal information comes from texts that have gone back and forth between traditions or extra biblical texts that people have written that just never became canon. Some of it even comes from occult grimoires, the Ars Goetia, for example which is the first book in the Lesser Key of Solomon, which was compiled in the mid-1600s. It, you know, it's a book of how to summon demons and devils, and it lists fallen angels, but it also lists and names specifically 72 angels that the occultist is to invoke to protect the occultist while they're summoning the devil and to constrain the devil and that sort of thing. So that's where we get a lot of these this, this information. Information, in quotes, I should say. <laughs> Info is info. It doesn't have to yeah. be true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> or not dangerous. There's a, a book that I, I've got here that I would strongly recommend to anybody who's interested in the topic. It is Gustav Davidson's A Dictionary of Angels, Including the Fallen Angels. It is ooh, 700 pages or so. And it is, first off, the introduction is absolutely fascinating. And then just the big list of angels is fascinating because Davidson is not religious. And so what he's done is try and gather as many angels from as many sources as he can and kind of cross-reference them. Hmm. Uh, it is a, a pretty fascinating book. Well, well worth getting hold of. It is relatively old. Yeah, copyright 1967, but it reads older than that. Let me put it that way. Hmm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it reads like 1910s. It's kind of an interesting read. Mm. Talking about angelic hierarchies, the best known and most influential Christian angelic hierarchy comes to us from Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite in the 4th or 5th century. Now, Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite, Pagite, I'm not entirely certain how to pronounce that. Betcha it's Areopagite. Areopagite could very well be. I'll take your word on that one. And, and you know what? I will take full, full uh, blame 
if if it's wrong. That's fair. Regardless, we'll just say pseudo Dionysius. That seems more, more. If nothing else, it's shorter. He is commonly agreed by scholars to be a pseudo epigraph. This is not the real name of the author. We don't know who the real author is. It's one of those works that, as was somewhat common at the time, somebody put a more famous name or some imp- relevant name on a document they had written. This is mostly influential because it influenced a number of other Christian thinkers, notably Thomas Aquinas used this hierarchy in his own works, that sort of thing. And this is not canonical, but again, this is interesting. And I think the structure that he provides and the orders of angels that he tries to categorize can offer us both gaming inspiration and get us thinking about what the purpose of angels is. Now, he's drawing heavily on a few specific passages in Scripture. Colossians 1.16 is a very important one for any angelology, Christian angelology, I should say. Uh, so, too, with the passage in uh, Galatians, that sort of thing. Yeah, there's a, a bit of Colossians 2 as well that is, is really big on on where angels are, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. But this, you know, he, Pseudo-Dionysius really draws on that whole, you know, thrones and powers bit right there for his hierarchy. And it's kind of telling the words Paul uses here are the same as those used by other Jewish writers in reference to the angels of God. So we that's kind of how we know, as it were, that he's talking about angels, even though when you translate it into English, it sounds an awful lot as if he's talking about earthly things. And in a way, he's probably talking about both. But again, it should be mentioned, Pseudo Dionysius also draws heavily on these other pseudographical and extra canonical works. Okay. So the hierarchy that he proposes is a three-tiered hierarchy of three spheres or three triads containing three orders of angels in each. And at the top, the first sphere, the highest order within all of these angels is the seraphim. Now the first sphere, all of the angels in the first sphere are the heavenly servants of Christ, the incarnated son. And the seraphim are the caretakers of God's throne. Uh, And we see them in Isaiah 6, 1 to 7. These are, seraphim literally translates as burning ones. These are the the highest class of angel. These are the familiar image that we have of the fiery six-winged being with two wings covering faces, two wings covering their feet, and two wings for flight. Then we have the cherubim. These are mentioned several times in the Old Testament, not only in Ezekiel, which I read, but also you'll hear them specifically called out as the angels guarding the way to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, in Ezekiel, the guards of the throne of God. And these are the ones with four faces, man, ox, lion, and eagle. Those, by the way, were later adopted as the symbols of the four evangelists. And then a lion's body, the feet of oxen. Yeah, I think we touched on that a little bit in our episode about Matthew. They have the lion's body, feet of oxen, four conjoined wings, uh, although in Revelation 4, 8, cherubim is specifically used, but they're given six wings like the seraphim. And these are closely connected to the Ophanim, the wheel-within-a-wheel creatures that you see in Ezekiel and also, I think, in Daniel. It's often easy to confuse the two. These are not the Ophanim themselves, okay? These are the mo- these appear to be like the motivating spirit that moves those wheeled creatures because you see, you know, the spirit of these creatures was within the wheels, right? But they're not the wheels themselves. Also, cherubim are not to be confused with putty. Putty are the to- the little toddler-like creatures you see in figurative art from the Renaissance on. They're of pagan origin, the little winged ba- uh, naked babies. Yeah, and it's also worth mentioning that this is not spelled the same way as like modeling clay. This is P-U-T-T-I. Yeah, it's Italian. Putty is plural. Putto is singular. These are like I said, they're of pagan origin, but they're adapted into Renaissance art as little figurative angels. In modern English, we confuse the two. I blame the Victorians. Yeah, we can we can safely blame the Victorians for a lot of stuff to do with modern English. <laughs> Is it art going wrong? It's the Victorians. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's sort of like the adjective cherubic kind of messes things up. Yes. There. I say we get back to cherubic, meaning four-faced and four-winged. <laughs> that would be that would be interesting, all right. <laughs> I, I imagine if we went back to that definition, we probably wouldn't hear the word quite so often anymore. 
I feel like this is Night Vale territory. I think this is where Night Vale can make a big difference <laughs> in the English language because they talk about angels a lot and angels in the Night Vale universe are the kind of cherubic that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're terrifying in and I love them. Ineffable cosmic horrors that also happen to be good. <laughs> No, but they definitely don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> and there is no hierarchy of angels. I'm going to talk about the no hierarchy thing as well, <laughs> not tongue in cheek. <laughs> anyway, so cherubim are guards. They're sort of the, the, the royal guard, if you will, in a, in a weird way. And then the third order of angels, the, the third in this first sphere, are thrones. These are the living symbols of God's authority and justice, carriers of the throne of God. There's a little bit of confusion here. There's not a lot that very clearly indicates what these look like, or at least, you know, represent themselves to humans as. Some sources claim that the 24 crowned elders who throw their crowns down before the throne of God in uh, the book of Revelation are thrones, but this is pretty heavily disputed on textual and theological grounds, kind of depending on a particular take on this, but in particular, we never really see angels crowned. It's only mortals who are given that. Yeah, that that sounds much more like saints than angels to me. It, it, that's, yeah. that's more the imagery that appears to have been gone for, but people kind of conflate thrones and, and the throne imagery and that sort of thing. Yeah, it happens. Just keep that in mind. So in the second, so the first sphere was the heavenly servants of Christ, the incarnated son, the Second sphere are the heavenly governors of creation. These are the ones in charge of matter, the rule of spirits, that sort of thing. And the first of the second, the first order here in the second sphere is dominions, also sometimes called lordships. These are upper management. These are regulators of the duties of lower angels, rarely physically known to humans, and these are pretty close to like what we see as the common modern representation of angels. Beautiful winged humans with one pair of wings, but they typically have orbs of light fastened to the heads of their scepters with the pommels of their swords, something that, you know, d denotes heavenly authority as opposed to earthly authority. And then beneath them, you have virtues, sometimes called strongholds. These are the, according to tradition, the angels, and according to pseudo Dionysius, the angels through whom God's signs and miracles are made in the world. These also are signifiers of God's strength and kind of reflective of God's strength and God's purity and virtue. Hence the name. All right. Not a lot of information out there about these. And then we have powers is in our sixth place here, also sometimes called authorities. And you'll note here dominions and powers, and then we're going to get into principalities. This is where we're really pulling on that Colossians chapter one text. Powers are the angels supervising the movement of the heavenly bodies. These are also, interestingly, warrior angels opposed to evil spirits, especially those evil spirits which manipulate the physical world. The, commonly, these angels are the ones that cast evil spirits into some prison or another. Uh, bear in mind, Pseudo Dionysius is writing again in like the 4th or 5th century. We're not quite sure when the text was actually created. And so he's talking about the movement of the heavenly bodies you know, he, he's not got a modern idea of astronomy, right? Right. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, but because these are warrior angels, they're often represented as fully armored soldiers with helmets and shields and with spears, chains to bind evil spirits with, that sort of thing. And then finally, we have a third sphere. And these are the angels who interact with mortals far and away the most commonly. Uh, these are guides, protectors, and messengers. And first we have principalities or rulers, protectors, and guides of large groups of people, nations, collected groups, a city, say, uh, institutions, notably the church itself. You also have amongst these principalities administrators who preside over the lower angels. Okay. And these are also educators and guardians of the earthly realm, purported to inspire mortals to arts and science and that sort of thing. And these are often shown wearing a crown and bearing a scepter, denoting their authority. And finally, we get into archangels and angels. Now, archangel is a little bit complicated. The Hebrew word from which archangel is derived is only ever used twice in the Bible, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, and in Jude chapter 1, verse 9. And archangels are supposed to be the first ranks of angels. The only archangel mentioned by name in the New Testament is Michael, 
And Archangel only ever appears in the singular in the Bible, which leads many Christian commentators to suggest that Michael is the Archangel. There's only the one. However, there are a lot of other sources, mostly Jewish and some apocryphal, that name other archangels. Uh, Raphael, for example, in the book of Tobit. Jenny, I, I, you pointed out that the Anglican Church has a specific intercessional prayer related to Uriel. Is that right? Yeah, I hate it. I hate that prayer a lot. Oh, okay. I like the angel, but I hate the prayer. The prayer is really like... It it's it's it doesn't sound Anglican at all. Okay, fair enough. It, because because we don't talk about the army of the church, it sounds very Salvation Army, and and it doesn't sound Anglican at all. And I really don't like it. We use Uriel as as one of the archangels because we list three. So we've got Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. But because we needed a fourth, because of the four cardinal directions, the four uh, gospels. And the four heads of the 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 big ones. Yeah, the four evangelists. We yeah. needed a fourth, and so we use Uriel for that. Okay. And and yeah, most of the stuff about Uriel is from the Book of Enoch, which I think you're you're going to talk about in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, briefly. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, Uriel is also a saint, and he's related to repentance and the sacrament of confirmation, and he's the keeper of beauty and light. And he's also the patron saint of, of poetry. He's an artist. There you go. And, and a sweetheart. Michael is also considered a saint. Saint Michael the Archangel. <laughs> yeah. So like all of the, 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 the four cardinal directions of Archangel are saints and patron saints as well. Right. So what's interesting is a lot of the business of figuring out how many archangels there are is sort of built around that sort of symbolic numerology. Yeah. Because many sources declare that the seven spirits that stand before the throne of God that are described in the Book of Enoch and in Revelation are the seven archangels. There's also a bit of theory that my mom and I have that isn't substantiated by anything else. But we've got a theory that archangels were used to sort of replace the classic Greek muses. Hmm. So so Uriel is all about poetry and stuff like that. So he was and and like the way that he is painted and depicted visually a lot is like, oh, it's the muse of poetry and and that kind of thing. So there you go. Yeah. Huh. Before we talk about Uriel a whole lot more. Oh, I love Uriel. What a good boy. Let's talk about angels. Right. So we, we've talked about archangels. The, the final order of angels is angels. These, this is the lowest order, and it's the most recognizable because these are the ones that we really see interacting with humanity and Israel most in Scripture. These are the angels concerned with the affairs of men. These are messengers, personal guardian angels, that sort of thing. Gabriel, when he's not accounted an archangel, is numbered among the angels. Is an important one, uh, an angel of the lowest order, because he, is that mess- he serves that messenger role. So that's Pseudo Dionysius's hierarchy, is his scheme of how the angels are sorted and ordered. And it's worth pointing out that many commentators agree that Paul is speaking about angels in Colossians 1.16, but this sort of structured hierarchy is not biblical. It's kind of fundamentally unsupported in the Bible. We just we know that there are types of angels, but we don't know how they're categorized, what their relations are, that sort of thing. If I had to hazard a guess. I don't think the Apostle Paul probably cares enough about the hierarchy to have put that down. No. He seemed very practical in most of his writings. That's true. Although, remember, he's drawing from earlier Jewish texts and other Jewish texts that talk very specifically about those types of angels. So bear that in mind. He certainly is, but it's just... He's not listing it there. Like, his main his main thing with Colossians is, we don't worship angels. Right. We worship... God, we worship Christ, we don't worship angels, angels are not worshipable. Yes, in fact, it's a very important part of Colossians, because it turns out that was a problem at the time. Uh, Yep. (laughs) (laughs) To finish up that point, I want to quote from John Gill's Exposition of the Bible. And John Gill was writing in the late 1600s, I believe. That's why this is a massive run-on sentence, I apologize. I've only got about a third of the sentence here. Oh, goodness. Yeah, Old writing, let me tell you, old English. But in his commentary on Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, an exposition of the Bible, I will link that in the show notes. It's a 
pretty neat work, honestly. Uh, he says that these angels, quote, are so called not as denoting different orders and degrees among them, which some have rashly ventured to describe, but because of the use that God makes of them in the government of the world and the executions of the various affairs of providence relating to particular persons and kingdoms. In other words, they're delineated not because of their hierarchy, but because they serve different purposes for God. We've talked a lot about Pseudo Dionysius and his hierarchy. There are plenty of others. The Wikipedia page for Christian angelology alone lists 10 others, and that is a small subset of them. Now, many of these reduce the total categories of angels to seven tiers rather than nine, especially ones created in the Middle Ages, because seven is, again, that significant heavenly number in Christian numerology. Others keep nine, but they have different numbers in different tiers and that sort of thing. So if you in your game or in your fiction or whatever are looking for something that is a hierarchy of angels but isn't as recognizable as the pseudo-Dionysius one, borrow one of the others. It's a good start. It'll look a little different and it'll be more fun. Yeah. So let's talk about names. Again, only two named in the Bible, Michael and Gabriel, and then two more, Satan and Apollyon, if you count fallen angels. The names of angels are complicated because as you go from text to text and tradition to tradition, the names get corrupted and changed. They're corrupted between texts, linguistic differences, because, you know, Hebrew doesn't have the same sound and the same pronunciation as Greek or Latin or Arabic or Persian, you name it. And then pronunciation changes over time, and that's just natural. And then you've also got people interfering, like Gregory the Great, thanks, who, uh, totally conflated the name Uriel and Fanuel, and they mean totally different things, and they're really different in the Book of Enoch. Not not that I'm saying that we should, like, follow the Book of Enoch as, as though it is actually part of the Bible, but, like, <laughs> thanks, Gregory! Yeah. So <laughs> You messed up, buddy! <laughs> Davidson has a list, by the way, of the names of Uriel here, right? So Uriel, uh, Regent of the Sun, also, by the way, Presider over Tartarus, is another of his titles. Mm -hmm. But he shows up variously as Serial, Nuriel, Urian, Jehuel, Oriel, Oroiel, Fanuel, Eremiel, Ramiel, Jeremiel, and Jacob Israel. Oh boy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a <an> mouthful. <awful. laughs> yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of these that I, I particularly like. Like Michael, for example, has a mystery name for one of the mystery cults devoted to the angels, which is Sabathiel. Huh. And he's also conflated with the Logos and the Metatron and that sort of thing. So, again, when, when we start getting into, like, cults of angels and that sort of thing, like what Paul was warning against, yeah, it gets real weird. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's a lot of weird occultic nonsense out there, people. Lots and oh, lots absolutely. of it. Oh, yeah. and, and angels are fascinating, right? Because Oh, yeah. Because they are where the divine comes down and touches humanity and they're discrete beings that maybe we can kind of wrap our heads around just a little bit. And the experience of them is apparently possible, you know, physically possible, but also ecstatic and terrifying and wonderful all at once. And that's mm -hmm. why, that's why I think angels fascinate us. They're that, that bridge in a certain way between us and God. They're, they're just sort of outside enough but they're perceptible in scripture. And certainly I think the idea of them as independent beings with, you know, their own will, like we see in Paradise Lost, for example, certainly fascinates us because with them it's drama in the courts of God. Mm -hmm. I do want to touch very briefly on fallen angels, not to speak a whole lot about them, but to mention that that is also part of Christian tradition. We're not going to be talking about them a great deal, but that, that is there. Yeah, if we ever do an episode on demons, which we'll probably get around to at some point, that's where we'll talk about them. <laughs> so that's that's kind of how they are portrayed in Christian tradition and, and extra biblical texts. But that is not the only portrayal of angels out there. Fiction, of course, loves to portray angels for all sorts of reasons. All right. So let's give Grant a little bit of a break because he's had a lot of research to recount back to us that he did. So you've obviously got your 
common like feather winged humanoid from the cute and childish kind of based on the, the putty all the way up to, you know, terrifying gigantic warriors in armor. Um, yeah. Sometimes they're divided up by jobs, uh, messengers, warriors, avengers, guardians, that sort of a thing. They are often depicted as both powerful and very harsh. A lot of popular culture and fiction tends to, for whatever reason, depict angels as kind of like disdainful, pity, pitiless killers a lot of the time that really don't much care for humanity and... We can call out Supernatural by name. Yeah, I, uh, that that's definitely, that's one of the archetypal examples of this, but it's not the only one. No, but it's the one that probably has the widest cultural spread in the Western world right now. They're on s- season 11 T. Bisquillion or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, they'll <laughs> stop making seasons when it stops making them money. Yeah, I mean, they didn't just... <sighs> They haven't just jumped the shark, but perhaps the aquarium at this point? They've jumped over the aquarium housing the sharks into the horse exhibit and started beating a dead horse. (laughs) With a shark. (laughs) With a shark? (laughs) Yeah. Yep. Yep, there's our analogy. Yeah. Anyway, if you want to get into- Excuse me while the laugh-induced coughing ends. <laughs> yeah, anyway, if you want to get into Supernatural, go through seasons one through five and stop when you see the outside of a house. Oh, I'd say one through two, actually, but- But then you don't get into the whole angel demon thing. That's fine. It's it's fun while they're just hunting urban legends. Fair. If you want to get more into the, the angelic depiction thing in Supernatural, specifically season four is when that really starts picking up, and then don't go past season five, that is when it goes completely off the rails. Yeah, yeah bonkers is not a strong enough word. Yeah, absolutely bonkers. Anyway, f- fiction gets weird with angels, and and I I love it. Uh, in nomine, uh, divides them up into choirs. I like in nomine. Yeah, I have some experience with a nomine. Um, so they've they've got kind of a hierarchy, and I'm not going to go through in the same kind of detail that Grant did. But just know that there is definitely some overlap. There's seraphim, cherubim, uh, ophanim. And then they get into some weird stuff. They've <laughs> they've got um like Curiotates and Mercurians and Grigory and they have something called Bright Lilim that starts out as demons and gets redeemed later and it's it's a role playing game. Mm-hmm. There's there's all kinds of weird nonsense. Yeah. Curatons are holy angels of God invoked in black magical conjurations as described in the Grimoires. According to huh. uh Davidson. Do they look like uh, benevolent Shoggoths in there? There is no illustration. That's the only, that's the full length of the entry. But, okay. All right. They're, and it's, it, so it's a similar name, but not quite exactly the same thing from the sound of it. It's probably derived from that. Well, Curaton is the singular. Okay. But yeah, it's, yeah, they're, uh, yeah, they're weird. They're like this cloud of like eyes and mouths that like possess groups of animals and like guide people around and stuff it's it's weird that's more under the the weird section less under the the humanoid section this one angel is these dozen squirrels It's, it's it's very strange so you can definitely get into some of kind of like the weird cosmic entity stuff that you see in uh the old testament or stuff that is inspired by it shall we say in fictional depictions gregory by the way or Out of Jewish legendary lore. The darkness books by Frank Peretti tend to go with pretty much the standard like winged humanoid thing, but they they operate almost on like an astral plane kind of a thing where it's like they overlap with the reality that we live in and can affect it pretty directly, but it's usually subtle and we can't tell. And they directly draw their strength from the prayers of the saints and stuff. They're they're interesting books, but and actually fairly good reads, but not the best in terms of theology, I don't think. Yeah, not not theologically sound. No. <laughs> On a little bit of a folkloric note, you will, in some more um, conservative traditions, like the one that I grew up in, I hasten to add, get like the traditional vanishing hitchhiker tale that's kind of uh, given an angelic gloss, like pick the hitchhiker up and they'll say something like Jesus is coming and then vanish. That's kind of a, a reference to uh, 
Hebrews 13, 1 and 2, I think, which is just, uh, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Yeah. I think we also talk about that in the Samson episode. Hmm. Yeah. Because an, an angel showed up, a, an angel slash maybe it was God showed up, because there was a lot of conflation in, in some of the Old Testament books about, is it an angel or is it god we just don't know right well and but that also even harkens back to to abraham yeah 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 where you know three visitors show up and it kind of seems like the text is saying yeah it's god and two angels don't worry about it yeah but also it's a high priest yeah Yeah. all right (laughs) okay (laughs) yeah heavenly folk Mm -hmm. oral tradition written down many years after it originated uh but you're right this is folkloric in many ways but it's the sort of modern folktale almost kind of like a christian urban legend in a way yeah i mean it it depends on a car right you know (laughs) those haven't been around for very long or i suppose like a coach or something like that which well but also sometimes you get like the person who joins you on the road for a little while and then disappears right and that's a a common trope that you still see in fantasy yeah i you know the the funny thing is i i can almost be certain that somebody presented one of these stories like it had happened to them at some point when i was growing up and it's like uh, even back then i was a little (laughs) bit skeptical but you you definitely see them go around certain churches and stuff a lot of the time in like youth groups and that sort of thing that sort of thing gets spread around so but yeah, you're it's it's very much, you know, Christian urban legend, Christian folklore, that sort of a thing. And now we get into my favorite, the weird, the ones that are definitely like yes. abstract, bizarre, unknowable, really really not human. Yes, the cosmic entity subset. Yeah. Yeah. That's like somewhat eldritch maybe. In some cases, absolutely. I think that does stem from wanting to sort of play up the the horror and terror. Uh, not horror. Horror is maybe the wrong word, but like the terror and well, the, well, the the mind bendingness, like the otherworldliness, otherworldliness. Yeah. So, like Neon Genesis Evangelion, mm. we have to mention it. They call the the monsters attacking Tokyo underwater tokyo angels literally though we should also note that literally according to the creator of neon genesis evangelion they literally just used christian symbology because they were bored of using buddhist symbology (laughs) so like they literally just did it for the cool factor they did not follow any sorts of pallet swap guidelines or anything like that that is more common in anime than anime fans want you to believe. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. It's just that NGE is the big one. I'm not even an anime fan, in a, by and large, and even I know that. <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, you've also got sort of like beings that are just made of light, like in C.S. Lewis's The Space Trilogy, or like in, in uh, Prince of Egypt, the movie, the angel of death is just this light. Mm-hmm. I gotta say, the the appearance of angels in that hideous strength has always really appealed to me. But the idea of plays into that otherworldliness where it just sort of appears as like a pillar of light, right? But when the the perspective character sees it, they kind of go, wait, that's at a weird angle. Why is that not straight? And then just by sheer presence of this angel, the whole perspective of the you know, the perspective character shifts. Uh, Mark is, is his name, I believe. And he realizes that it's not that this angel, this pillar of light that he's seeing is at some funny angle to Earth. It's that the angel is oriented correctly to God and the universe. And it's Earth that's a, that's a kilter. And it's his perspective that's a kilter. Yeah. And then he just kind of gets dizzy and falls down. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's a wonderful scene. We, uh, I, I remember you referencing that like way back in some episode we did in the first year of the podcast. But yeah, that's that's a, a really cool way of depicting. There are weirder angels out there, like the 
I don't, I forget what they're called, but like the, the dog like ones that you saw in like the monster manual from D and D things like that. Oh, hound archons. A lot of those archons are just yeah. kind of odd. Yeah. There's lantern archons. Uh, Pathfinder's got an animated flying orrery. And I think a, it's either Pathfinder or one of the D and D editions has like hollow glowing winged helmets that fly around and are like minor celestial beings we're going to be talking about those a lot next uh, next episode because using those as something other than a critter to fight it, it must be necessarily interesting yeah by the way i looked up uh curiotates there's not a whole lot in here uh it just says in his karmic relationships rudolf steiner th- speaks of three celestial hierarchies the curiotates being an order of the second all right then Probably the vagueness was why the game designers felt like they could go a little bit nuts yeah. with the description. Because I'm sure that that book, it was on the shelf of the Anomine game designer. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever <laughs> about yeah. that. The translation here is, uh, the triad here consists of exousiae, virtues or authorities, karyotates, dominations with a question mark, and dynamis, or powers. Hmm. So. Interesting. Yeah. Karyotates. Also weird. Yeah. Benevolent Shoggoths. At least in appearance. Not so much in behavior. Not a whole lot of, like, going around absorbing things, but... Oh, uh, well, thank goodness for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's angels. Yeah. Yep. Sort of. And all of their complexity and yep. weirdness... Well, not all of it. As There's much a as lot we, we haven't yeah, managed okay. to get into, oh, yeah. trust in, me. In the highlights, uh, in the broadest possible highlights of their complexity and weirdness. Like, we didn't even touch on the angel of the Lord who went before the Hebrews as they escaped Egypt, you know, in the, the in a pillar of fire and cloud. Oh, yeah. yeah. There, there's all sorts of things we could talk about in terms of, like, interactions between angels. I mean, to a certain degree, we're leaving those as an exercise to the reader of Scripture. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we've we've touched on a few here and there, but... Some of that may come up in our next episode, yeah. too, as we're talking about ways of using them, because... They do interact with people a fair bit in scripture, and it's not terrible to keep that stuff in mind if you're planning on using them as a plot device. Mm -hmm. Next episode, we're going to talk about turning all of this information into something in your game. I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be a lot of fun. So am I. I'm going to get to talk about a game that that I just backed on Kickstarter, and I'm really, really excited to talk about that. Oh, cool. That sounds good. Do you want to mention it here real quick so I can link it in the show notes, or do you want to save it for next episode? I'll, I'll mention the title here because I think the, the Kickstarter itself is officially over. It's called Exodus. Oh. Oh, okay. I, I got in on it a little bit late. No, oh, fair enough. All right. Well, if you want to give us feedback on this, hit us up on Twitter, on even on Facebook, our Discord channel, which you can find at our website, stgcast.org. Uh, comment on our posts, by the yeah. way, on, on our website, stgcast.org. We are more than happy to have a, a conversation there as well, and that lends itself well to long-form conversations. But our Discord's a great place to chat with not just us, but plenty of other listeners as well. And if you'd like to leave us a review on iTunes, so I'd really encourage you to do that. We haven't got one of those in a while, and I don't know if we should start doing the thing where we read off reviews, but nah. you know, like it's a little self-promoting and uh, a little navel gazy. And there are podcasts that I really like like min max that do this and i i love hearing those but feels weird to do <sighs> it does well we've we've never done it it's it's one of those things that i feel like you kind of need to establish as a podcast tradition yeah early. that's true and we're like six and a half <laughs> years in so yeah. we'll let the people who did think to do that early do it and have it as their thing and we will have yes. other things that's fair like patreon yes. questions that's fair so yep all right <laughs> but if you want to leave us one of those reviews please feel free to do so. Those do help us quite a bit. Yeah. And, you know, share us around. If you enjoy this episode, share it around. That's really one of the easiest ways to help us is just let people know, hey, this is a cool episode. People who are interested in me on social media, I think you'll find this interesting. Take a minute to do that. Like right now, Hmm. unless you're driving. Don't do that. Yep. Drive safely. All right. We're getting slightly silly. It's late. Yeah. We should call it a, uh, to a halt here. Folks, thank you very much for listening. We really appreciate it. We'll see you in two weeks for more Angel Talk. We'll catch you next time. See ya. See you later, folks. This has been a production of Saving the Game. 
All episodes are produced and published under a Creative Commons 4.0 attribution, share-alike license. Our logo is by Ruben Smith Zimple of 3d6design.com. Our music is The Promised Place Beyond the Clouds by James Opie. You can find more of his music at nihilor.com. To hear our past episodes, to find syndication and license details, to connect with our fantastic listener community, or to contact us or support our show through Patreon, visit our website at stgcast.org or savingthegamepodcast.org. God bless, do good, and happy gaming.